Hey folks, I'm Alex Dowd. And I'm Katie Reif. Two sea monsters take human form and cause some mild mischief on the scenic coast of Italy. That's the plot of Luca, the latest animated adventure from Pixar, which hit Disney Plus today. How does the movie stack up to past efforts from this cartoon dream factory? We'll discuss that and more on a special bonus episode of the show. Welcome to Film Club. So, Dow, before we get too much into it, I had to chuckle at your intro there. You described the events of this film as mild mischief, which I felt like was damning with faint praise a little bit. Oh, you caught that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yes. I mean, honestly, if you asked me to describe Luca in one word, uh, mild would be a pretty good one, I think. Yep, yeah, mild's uh, a good one. Yeah. This is a, a very mild film in some ways. Um, Minor. Minor, yep, minor, minor, uh, minor's a great one too. I have not written my review yet, but um, I guess uh, it, it will be out by the time this podcast is out. And I, mm-hmm. w- I would not be, no one should be surprised if they go, if they click over to that and they find both the word mild and the word minor in that review. <laughs> so, in the written review as well, right, yeah. yeah. And you know what? Those type of films, this type of film, are the hardest one to write about. This is a bit of a tangent, but a film where you watch it and go. Yeah, that was okay. You know, yep. that's way more, way harder than a rave or a pan. So good luck to you. Thank you. It's going to be tricky. Um, or I guess speaking in the past tense now, it was tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Time travel. Woo. <laughs> I Do you ever wish you could just uh, zap to after a review is finished? And you could of just course. admire your uh, work and uh, not, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's always the best part. It's like working out. It's like my favorite part of the workout is when I'm done. <laughs> you know, when it's over. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, I mean, writing is like a, the high of uh, the assignment, and then a big deep pit of the actual work, and then the high of finishing. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I, uh, I I don't know who said this, and I quote it all the time. I should actually probably figure out the source of this quote because I use it so much. But um, uh, somebody. Of some of of some renown once said, um, I never got into a sentence I couldn't wait to get out of. Yeah, um, fair enough. And uh, that I think pretty perfectly describes my love hate relationship with writing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Well, okay, so this is a bonus episode of the show reviewing Luca, and something that we kind of talked about on our main episode about Pixar in general was the idea that this these latter-day Pixar films kind of feel like a bunch of different movies smushed into one. Mm-hmm. And this, to me, kind of had that random quality to it. It was like, why Italy? Why sea monsters? You know, like the internal logic of why all this was happening with these characters in this place, like, was not very uh, watertight to me. Also, they have um, they have Italian names. But they don't. That was so weird. They don't have Italian accents. No, that's weird, right? And, so, <laughs> and some characters, yeah. Uh, this movie was really fickle in the way it jumped in and out of being Italian. You know, like the characters have Italian names, and sometimes we'll say stuff to each other in Italian. But overall, yeah, they have American accents and everything. I mean, this is this is just an endemic problem in films in general. If For you sure. Know. <laughs> but but here, just. Here, a lot of the elements to me seemed like they were pulled out of, you remember those magnetic poetry kits that you could, uh, it was just random words. Oh, yeah, make totally. Sentences on a fridge. Yeah. That's, I kind of felt that way about Luca. It felt like a magnetic poetry of Pixar films to me. <laughs> well, or, or like the mood board for it was, um, was a lot of, uh was a lot of Italian culture. They were just like, you know, Italians yeah. like pasta and they like this beautiful <laughs> classical Vespas. music and Vespa. Oh my God, it, it plays a little bit like an advertisement for Vespa, doesn't it? A little bit, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Vespa is a brand name. It is. Major- it's like Band-Aid, right? Mm-hmm. And Vespa's a brand name, yeah. It's just called a scooter. And um, yeah, so the basic plot of the film is you have this boy who's a sea monster who comes out of the sea um, and when they dry off, they turn into humans. It's another, that's another grab bag element of this film to me. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just run with the logic of this. Yeah. And so he comes out of the sea and meets another sea monster boy who is living ab- above the land. And together they embark upon the shared dream of getting a Vespa 
so they can ride around the world and explore the world. Yeah, and, and there obviously there are some there are some underlying uh, tensions that might be motivating some of this dream as well. It's not simply that they love Vespas, but it certainly manifests as a lot of gushing over Vespas for a lot of the movie, you know? Sure, yeah. There's it, like a like a fantasy sequence midway through where Vespas are jumping in a in a field of flowers like fish jumping out of the water. <laughs> That's right. Um, we should mention that the two characters, uh, the, 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 the Shire boy, the one who, uh, has some reluctance about coming out of the water, his name, his name is, uh, is Luca. He's the, the title character. Uh, he is voiced by Jacob Trembley, who you might remember as the little kid in Room. He's building mm-hmm. a bit of a, a little, a little bit of a, a resume for himself at this point. And, um... The other kid is, uh, he's sort of the more, slightly more dashing kid. His name's Alberto, and he is voiced by Jack Dylan Grazer. And you might remember Jack Dylan Grazer as Eddie in the It movies. Um, mm-hmm. so he plays the young, he plays Eddie as a boy in the It movies. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you talk about this this uh, it being kind of a grab bag of different components. One of them, I think, is The Little Mermaid. I think there's a little bit of The Little Mermaid Oh, in this, yes. You know? Oh, yes. This kid it's who definitely The Little of, Mermaid. Yeah, I mean, this kid who dreams of going above, he, he, he's basically a merboy, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And he dreams of going out on, on the land. Although I will say that the movie doesn't dramatize that in – quite as strongly as I think uh, it it maybe should have. Um, you think about The Little yeah. Mermaid. Ariel gets a big number about wanting to see the world above. I mean, her desires are very clearly laid out. Um, Luca kind of – Luca's kind of curious, and he stumbles up there eventually, you know? No, I mean – the oh, right, like I I very much agree with the Little Mermaid uh, thing, except it's like it's the Little Mermaid, but instead of being motivated by love, it's motivated by a desire for adventure. Right. Um. But the thing in the Little Mermaid is, yeah, they establish that Ariel has been fascinated with the world above for a very long time, and she has a secret room full of things that she's found on the ocean floor that humans have dropped in the ocean, and in here, Luca goes from finding a playing card and a clock to uh, being obsessed with leaving the surface very quickly. They establish, and in fact, at the beginning of the film, he's afraid to go to the surface, and he never wants to go up there, and he the, the switch flipped really fast, character-wise. Yeah, it feels a little, it feels a little rushed, doesn't it? Uh, I, I thought so, yes. Like, there's very little world-building. Like, we don't get a whole lot of a sense of what, the I mean I guess we see it, it's a simple life underneath the water but it, it's one it's the rare Pixar movie that I feel like does not devote an enormous amount of its time and resources to building an elaborate world you know oh uh, very little world building in the undersea world for yeah. sure the undersea world almost felt like an afterthought to me yep yeah yeah I I would agree that it was almost like well we'll figure that part out later and then when we do see it it's just like I don't know Finding Nemo basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and with Pixar, too, you know, a big part of the thing is the beauty of the animation. And I was a little disappointed they didn't do more with kind of underwater effects. Yeah, yeah. There, there's not a lot of this is set underwater, maybe because they've already done Finding Nemo and they figured we don't need to focus too much on that. Um, I suppose so. I did, in general, like the animation. I thought that there are some, there's some, there's some lovely slapstick in it. Um, you know, you can always kind of count on Pixar to get the – to get sort of precise mannerisms down right. And um, mm-hmm. they have some fun with the fact that when the boys get wet, they turn into their true selves. They, they, they become sea monsters again. So there's a lot of scenes in this film that are about like them trying to avoid getting wet or them quickly drying themselves off when they get hit with a splash of water uh, yeah. you know, above the surface. Obviously, it's also, I mean, it is a it is a feast for the eyes to the point where a part of me thinks that as minor as this thing is, it still would have been nice for audiences to be able to see it on the big screen, you know? Yeah. Um, the thing about the animation that I enjoyed is an, also something that we touched on in our main episode this week, which was I really liked what they did with texture. Mm. I liked what they did with the surface of the water. The surface of the water looked photorealistic to me. It almost looked like they had uh, spliced in live action yeah. footage of an ocean and I thought that was pretty cool the character design was pretty I wasn't terribly uh, moved or thrilled by the character design I thought it was pretty pretty typical for Pixar particularly in the way that they the different shapes they made the humans out of well it certainly matches the I feel like the kind of um, the skimpy character development you know yeah <laughs> I mean they're not the most distinctive looking characters uh, visually, but they're also not the most distinctive in terms of how they've been written, 
you know? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, the motivation is very similar to what we see in a lot of uh, in Pixar films and in kids movies in general. So it's not unique to Pixar. It's all about like, um, I, I mean, I think that they laid it out in a way that's maybe a little bit more nuanced than normal in the sense that a lot of kids movies are about wanting to go away from where you are from and see the world. Right. Yep. But I thought that this one was interesting and it laid it out a little bit more nuanced in the sense that Luca was finding out that bigger parts of the world exist. Like his world got bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the movie. And I think that's something that is a little more specific to the actual experience of childhood. And so I'll give them uh, some credit for that. No, it's one of the one moments. That's a great point because one of the one moments in the movie where I felt like this was threatening to get into the territory of – of, of classic Pixar was the moment when they, they meet this young girl who becomes kind of the third lead of the film. She's a human girl, doesn't know that they're sea monsters. And she starts to teach Luca about what the, basically about what the stars are and what the universe mm-hmm. is. And Luca starts to understand that the, that, the, that the ocean is part of, is part of a larger world and that the world is part of a larger galaxy and the galaxy is part of a larger universe. And Mm -hmm. this excitement that kids sometimes feel about this, that expanding consciousness about just how, I mean, for me, that was growing up, that was a very scary thought was how small we are compared to the Mm -hmm. the vast expanse of the world. I could see it being exciting too. Uh, But I thought that that was the one aspect of the film that felt um, remotely specific. You know? Yeah, I like the way you put it as expanding consciousness because at the beginning of the movie, Luca doesn't even know that this town exists above the water, let alone a city beyond the town, let alone other countries, other oceans, other planets. And him having his mind blown by that, uh, yeah, struck at something a little more profound than I think the pretty formulaic story about. Uh, so basically... Uh, the our trio that we referred to needs to win a triathlon weight race in order to get money to buy the Vespa. A triathlon, by the way, though, where the the three uh, activities that they're doing are bicycling, swimming, and eating pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Italia of it all was a bit much at times. No, I mean, it's honestly, this is this is very much a Disney theme park version of Italy, and um, mm. it's it's obviously rendered with a lot of craft and affection, and um, I don't know, debatably respect respectfully. There's a little bit of, I guess, there's a little bit of stereotyping, but it's mostly, I, I would say, probably of the harmless variety. It's mostly just yeah. Like, there's nothing insidious about the right, stereotypes right, right, right. Movie. Italians are passionate people who like pasta and to talk loudly sometimes. That's yeah. basically and have it. a lot of joie de vivre. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's basically the extent of it. Stereotyping. So yeah, <laughs> not a big deal. But at the same time, like anyone. Them presenting this as some sort of love letter to Italy. This is more like a love letter to Italy in quotation marks. Yes, the Epcot Center version of Italy. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. (laughs) And it being in this little isolated small town also kind of enhances that Epcot Center feel. Because it is a, a small place. Exactly, like we're yeah. just we're just walking around looking at different attractions, basically, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, I am going to have to disappoint some listeners when I say that, that they're, you know, when the trailer for this premiered, everybody was like, oh my God, it's Pixar's version of Call Me By Your Name. And um, I'm, I, I, I must tell you that the, um, the teenage boys in this do not have a romance. Um, no. However. No. I would say there is at least one moment that suggests that on some level this might be going for some muddled metaphor about being closeted or something. There's there, I, I'm reluctant. Actually, it's it kind of traipses into spoiler territory, so I'm reluctant to I'm reluctant to say it to be honest. Well, skip ahead. Press that 15 second skip ahead button twice right now. Good. Okay. Good Go point. Ahead, and I'll say so. Spoiler alert. There is a moment where one of the boys is basically uh, outed as a sea monster. And the mm-hmm. other one, uh, instead of standing with him in solidarity, says, oh, no, a sea monster, basically. And I think it's possible to read that moment as um, as one of the boys re- basically recoiling in, in recoiling in, in shame or not wanting to be revealed himself. And there are certain y- you could look at that as some sort of metaphor for a, a larger intolerance in the world of people who might not who might be different in some way, uh, particularly in a small town. Uh, again, mm-hmm. that's I think it's kind of a muddled idea in the film. 
Um, it doesn't hold up to a ton of scrutiny, but there yeah. might have at least there might be a seed of an idea there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I was glad. I always kind of appreciate when they don't really have a love interest in an animated film or family film or any mm-hmm. film. You know, it's just so common that uh, I appreciated that the, the Luca and the girl don't have a romance either. There's no right. no romance whatsoever right. going on in the film. Um, the <laughs> something about this film that I thought was interesting was it's sort of its view on Italy reminded me in a way of like when Studio Ghibli will picture Europe. <laughs> yeah, it's well, a, it's this this fairy tale castle version of Europe where you know every rooftop is. Um, crooked in a very aesthetically pleasing sort of way. And in the end credits of this movie, this isn't really a spoiler. The end credits of this movie, they did the exact same thing they do in the end credits of My Neighbor Totoro. Yeah. (laughs) Where they show all the characters, you know, having little moments moving forward in their life uh, in still drawings that uh, fade in and out over the credits. And, that kind of struck me. I was like, okay, so, you know, that that that's a pretty blatant homage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the so the filmmaker, his name is uh, Enrico Casarosa, and he mm-hmm. uh, he's kind of making the leap to the big leagues. He did um, he did a Pixar animated short. I mean, a lot of the time with Pixar, somebody that is sort of the that's the advancement track that you have at Pixar is you make a short and then eventually you graduate to doing one of the features. Um, that's so fair. You, yeah, yeah. So he did La Luna a few years ago. One one of the Pixar shorts um, was up for uh, the Academy Award. Um, he uh, he has cited Miyazaki as an influence mm-hmm. on this film. Um, he's also cited uh, Fellini, and I feel like both those both those aspects are um, if those are influences on this, they're influences in a in a kind of superficial way. I'd say. Um, yeah. Pixar has a well, way yeah. of, of taking these of I mean actually this is very much a Disney thing too of saying. We were influenced by these different filmmakers, or these different movies, or this different art movement, and then they all kind of coalesce into a sort of um, safe, familiar, and um, and e- even slightly formulaic uh, look and feel. Absolutely, this movie one hundred percent went through the Disney quality control machine, yeah. and the only <laughs> Fellini. There's a poster for La Strada hanging right, up in the right. town at one point, but uh, I, yeah, other than that, I didn't really see much Fellini. In this. I mean, I guess just that it's set in a small, quirky Italian town or something. You know? I, I guess so. Um, but they didn't even have a circus, man. Come uh, on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um. I, I think this is a perfectly this is, this is a perfectly watchable film, and I think that kids might enjoy it. Um, it in the grand scheme of Pixar, I think it's it's the word you used at the beginning of the episode, minor. I think this is a very minor film. Um, I'm not terribly shocked that Disney made the decision to just release it direct to streaming, um, even if I do think that some of its visual pleasures would look nice in the big screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would I would agree that this is. I, a uh, not so great Pixar film is still better than a lot of the animated films that come out. Well, with that caveat, this is not the film that is going to return the studio to its, you know, late 2000s highs. All right, everybody, thanks for listening. Luca is now streaming on Disney Plus, and please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Film Club wherever you get your podcasts. This week's special bonus episode of Film Club was hosted by me, Alex Dowd, and by Katie Reif. It was produced and edited by Carl Blomberg. Our sound mixer and finishing editor is Zach Goldsboro, and our motion graphics designer is Julie Mullins. Thanks for listening, and you can check out the full episode of Film Club this week on Pixar, wherever you get your podcasts. Bye!